The Bank of Canada did a second rate cut this week and hinted at even more to come. On top of this, the U.S. inflation print came out today and it was lower, hitting 3%, sending that country and those markets into a bit of a frenzy with full anticipation of their cut to happen in September. On top of this, mortgage originations are actually increasing. So it begs the question, is the housing market out of the woods? Well, not so quick. There are definitely other very key metrics to understand, and we're going to dive into all of those today and see how they affect the Vancouver market. Let's dive in. So the rate cut was the big news, of course, this week. The markets were absolutely correct. They were pricing in over a 90% chance of that cut happening, and there you have it. It did. 0.25. We've now gone from 5% to 4.5% overnight rate. Quarter point, 0.5 total, not much, but I think what was more important there is the forward guidance that's essentially being alluded to, where ultimately markets have now predicted and priced in that by the end of 2024, as of today, we can expect the overnight rate to be at 4%. Okay, so 100 basis point cut from the top this year, four cuts total, 425. We'll see how that evolves, but that's where today's prediction is. But how does that ultimately play out for the average homeowner? or potential home buyer? And does the current intent of it hitting 4% allow for somebody who has been kind of holding on for dear life, if you will, with those higher mortgage payments, does it give them enough incentive or hope, if you will, even, that they can keep paying just a little bit longer and that their mortgage will be far more digestible, if you will, by the end of this year and moving into 2025, or even another 100 basis points of cuts are predicted as of today? Too far out to make that, but you get the idea. Let's break it down by the numbers. If you had, let's say, a half million dollar mortgage, your payments at the beginning of this year were $2,684-ish. That's now down $300 to $2,387. Okay, so $300 a month relief on a half million dollar mortgage or about $3,600 per year. Should those cuts go further, obviously the payments go lower. So we're at a 12% drop already, 12%. Um, pretty significant, and we will see how this continues to pan out. But of course, um, I think some people are starting to feel relief and probably feel like they can see that light at the end of the tunnel. Yeah, and I think it largely also depends on um, whether or not how buyers are interpreting these rate cuts too. Because the Bank of Canada did come out and say, hey, listen, we're going to, over the next 18 months, we're going to drop rates by 200 basis points. and so. You know, there's some pros and cons to that. <clears throat> and I think one of the questions that I, I think a lot of home sellers and, and, and some home buyers are probably wondering is, you know, should I go in now? Should I go in when we're down 1% one, 1 or should I go in at the bottom when the bank has gone through its rate cutting cycle and we find ourselves down at 3% instead of 4%? Well, there's kind of pros and cons to both, right? And kind of like we've talked about before, if you decide to wait, which I think a lot of buyers are doing because they now have guidance, forward guidance from the Bank of Canada. So they have an idea as to when this is going to take place. And they may be waiting until they get close to that 200 basis point drop before you start to see them really come in. The other side of that is you will end up with far more competition when money gets cheaper. We've seen it before. We'll probably see it again. And so we're seeing a lot of people right now take on two-year mortgages trying to get a deal done now by getting a better price only to then refinance when rates are at that bottom. So we're seeing a bit of both, you know, risk tolerance for each person and on top of that, what they can also afford. So with that said, there is a caveat and it is our standing inventory. Uh, prices likely won't move even if rates come down uh, until that standing inventory gets chewed into which I think it will over time. So anyhow, with that being said, let's touch on US inflation because that was also the news for today. Uh, it's down 0.3%, from 3.3% down to 3%. And it was predominantly around lower consumer spending. And this actually increased the odds of an interest rate cut in September by 85.7%. So we expect you're going to see a hold on July 1st, or sorry, July 31st, when it comes to an interest rate announcement. But I think once we get into September, you're likely going to see that cut. 
Now, let's not forget, Canada has already cut twice in advance of the U.S. And cutting, you know, and continuing to cut without seeing the U.S. cut would do in, you know, it would do quite a lot of damage to our dollar, the value of our dollar. And in many ways, it wouldn't fix the inflation issue because if the dollar goes down in value, then we have to spend more in order to get the same things. It's basically importing our inflation. So what's very interesting too is we're going to see the next announcement for Canada on September 4th. The U.S. is going to uh, come out on the 18th of September. And right now, the U.S. has been at 5.5% for 12 months, a full 1% higher than Canada. But with that said, they're both trending down. We're at 2.7% in inflation for Canada. We'll see how we continue going on this path towards 2%, though we both believe we'll see interest rates hovering around 3% at the end of 2025 feels positive, I think, for people that have been watching this and, and hoping that it does trend lower and uh, who are sick of paying what feels like exorbitant prices every time they leave the house. Now, one quick clarification, I think in my earlier messaging here, my earlier piece, I talked about uh, the, the $300 a month reduction on the 500k mortgage. That's if we get the full 100 basis points. We're only halfway there now. We're at 6% lower so far, 12% and 300 bucks should we drop down to uh, 4% overnight rate. Okay, now we want to explore a bit of what's happening in the rental market because there's a, a dynamic shift that is underway here. And we're going to start hearing a lot more about this as time moves forward. Looking at sort of where the rental market sits today, I mean, the rented accommodation sub-index, as they call it, of the CPI print, it was up 8.5% uh, year over year, which is obviously incredibly high. But let's dig a little bit deeper. Let's look behind the curtains on this one, because the month-over-month -month increase of that index was actually the lowest it's been in two years. So the rate of rental cost going up is slowed to the lowest amount in two years. This was largely influenced by rental completions, right? All these buildings that have been taking advantage of the CMHC financing are starting to complete, right? These are buildings that have been under construction for two, three, four, five, six years. And just last month, we saw 11,000 rental units come online. This is nationally, of course. Plus, there's currently 140,000 purpose-built rental units in the construction pipeline today. That's 6% of the total rental stock available, and, and that's going to add a ton more. And it's even exacerbated here in British Columbia, where we're adding 15% of total units to the rental space. Great news if you are a renter and you're sick of these high rents, that should provide a little bit of downward pressure on pricing. Most of those 140 units I spoke about, too, are completing over the next two years across the country here. Now, on top of this too, we've got purpose-built rental starts, right? So are there new, is there a new product coming behind those ones that are completing? Well, actually there sure is because rental starts actually just hit an all-time high where 47%, almost half of every new home being built out of the ground today is purpose-built rental. Well needed, of course, as we've talked long, and well, I mean, the rental rates alone speak to that, but this is also happening at the same time where a lot of the private investors, your mom and pop landlords, if you will, are pulling out of that landscape, especially here in BC, where we found all the recent legislation and policy changes really work against investors. So they're simply deploying capital elsewhere. We're seeing a lot more investment properties hitting the market, et cetera, right? It all moves in cycles. And I think realistically, the rental housing starts have likely peaked. Okay, as mentioned here, one of the main reasons that that's going to happen is because CMHC has gone and changed their requirements when it comes to being able to have a developer qualify for their cheap financing and, and their great terms that they offered, 50-year AMs, etc. This was a very successful policy that they offered, and maybe they were a victim of their own success. But either way, it's changed, and now it's a lot harder to qualify, especially in BC. On top of this, we continue to see new city fees and these are ultimately compounding and really reducing the viability of being able to bring a new product to market. Perfect example locally here, where just this week, BOSA announced they would not be moving forward with two purpose-built rental towers that they had planned for the last six months in the Metrotown area. 
they are not moving forward. That would have created 1,200 rental units. And the main reason that they said, well, it's fees. Okay, the recently approved introduction of what's called amenity cost charges or ACCs and updates to the development cost charges or DCCs pushed that project's numbers into a loss. So they canned it. The senior director of development over at BOSA, his name's Carl Wright, he quoted the following, and I, and I am going to read this verbatim. Despite the potential for significant density, the low land price and our internal decision to underwrite below market CMHC program interest rate assumptions, the project was not even close to meeting the minimum return thresholds necessary to justify the investment. If our site wasn't viable for investment, we're certain the whole community plan is unviable without a policy change. So they're basically saying, look, if it doesn't work for BOSA, it's not working for any other developers, right? It's, it, it's quite dramatic how big this loss actually would have been. And part of what they described here is that this, this Royal Oak site, the inclusionary affordable units, okay, their, their below market rent units were effectively around 60% below the current market rate. Okay, 60%. I mean, as a renter, that sounds absolutely fantastic. But however, you take that loss in revenue, you add on top of the fees and taxes and everything else, then Bose's numbers basically said, well, the cost to build these units would have been about $350,000 greater than the value of those finished units, translating into a $90 million loss over the entire phase of that development. Nobody's going to go and build something where they're basically guaranteed to lose $90 million. So maybe a bit of an isolated scenario here, but again, like I said, I think the OCP for that area is just unattractive to developers. And we're going to start to see this trend that I think is now peaking for rental starts and under construction, right? Numbers don't lie. It shows that that's where we are today, but I think we can expect that to drop off dramatically. Compound that with the mom and pop and private investors pulling back, you know, rental rates may be decent and trend down for the next year or two. But I think there's uh, an underlying supply issue, even in the rental space coming up around 2027. I mean, it's unlikely that Bosa would even build it if there was a $9 million loss, right? I, I can't imagine that, you know, a developer of that magnitude or a developer really of any magnitude is going to build something to lose money. It's just not a scenario that ever makes sense. And, you know, you got to ask yourself, what kind of, uh, I guess, what kind of consultation was done with private industry to make sure that, you know, your amenity cost charges and things like that actually do pencil? Because if you're looking at acquiring land, land's usually the big problem is, is the cost of land. But, you know, Bose was quoting here that land was actually quite affordable in that respect. So that shows you maybe how high these city fees are. And in some way, shape, or form, maybe prohibitive to the kinds of development that that neighborhood may, may want too. So there's there's definitely some politics at play there, I I would imagine. With that said, though, let's look at uh, employment because employment is a very important metric uh, in determining where we're going here with interest rates. Uh, as two years of increased interest rates continue to work their way through the system here, employment you have to have to keep your eyes on it. So. Employment insurance claims jumped 3% in May and are up 5.7% in the past three months alone. Now that is at its highest level since January of 2022. And the share of consumers stating that it has become harder to find a job in their particular line of work has jumped from 38% one year ago to 50% in this quarter. Business lending annual growth rate is just 0.1%, so effectively no growth. This is the weakest since mid-2021, and with business insolvencies still trending upwards, it's no surprise that banks are pulling back on, on their loans. You've got to also think here too, loan loss provisions are what banks have had to tuck away in, in the event that their loans that they put out don't come back. And across all six major banks, loan loss provisions are up 26% this year over last year, meaning they're anticipating more and more businesses that are going to fail. And it's not just businesses, too. You're looking primarily at, at, at business loans, auto loans, and commercial, specifically commercial real estate loans. Loan loss 
provisions for residential mortgages are much lower by comparison because people will almost do everything they can to keep their property before giving that up. And that's historically been the case. And normally, and try and make your homework, uh, it's, it's your last stand. So people will let their businesses fail and try and figure something else out, go and get a different job or something like that before they're prepared to give up their home. So we'll see where we go from here. Shifting into housing starts now, let's see how Trudeau and his accelerator program is doing. Are we seeing new homes being built or at least the intent of new homes being built? Because, you know, when he first campaigned, he campaigned on affordable housing and well, then housing ripped and doubled in price. So he's getting a mulligan here. We're trying again. Let's see if he can do it. Let's see how it's going. Well, new housing starts have been on a steady decline for about three years now. They've dropped 9% nationally in June and are sitting at about 240,000 right now. This is well below the expectations of 255,000. Eh, tough start there. But to further exacerbate future supply, building permit applications. Okay, this is where like, you know, he's had since April. So now people's building permits should be in place. Well, those dropped 12% in May. And they're down 16% in the residential sector alone. Closer to home here in BC, building permits in June dropped 53% month over month. Now, albeit, yes, April was strong. So you had a high baseline to drop from, but 53%. The spike that we saw in April was because that was the last month that people could submit their applications for CMHC financing. So that was for the rental sector, but either way, building home building permits and housing starts are way down. And that's likely why we saw that big drop off in, uh, in May there. But again, keep watching this space because I'm fully of the belief that in this hostile and increasingly hostile env environment for developers, a la that BOSA story, we're going to continue to see building permits for significant housing trend downwards for the rest of this year. Yeah. I mean, you, you got to think it's not an environment that's, uh, looking bright for this sector. Furthermore, I mean, it's going to be exacerbated by, you know, lower per capita GDP growth. In fact, I think we're slated to be the lowest of all OCED countries. And, you know, when you're a developer and you're looking to make an investment, a four to five year investment, chances are it's not, it's not like BOSA is just not going to build that and sit on the sidelines until they can go build. They're going to go find a different market to build in and they'll make that successful there. Right. And then in lieu of that, that's going to push what would have been another 1,200 units even further down, right? So it, it does compound, which is, this is why this is not good news. And if we, we turn a little bit to mortgages here, uh, there's a little bit of bright news, at least in the residential space here. Mortgage originations here rose 0.3% month over month in May, with annual growth sitting at 3.5%. So this appears to have bottomed out here in late 2023. And with this week's cut, future predictions, sorry, future predictions of cuts, we'll likely see this increase slowly, especially over the next 18 months, as I alluded to earlier, with the forward guidance from the Bank of Canada saying they're going to continue to bring rates down. So three and four year fixed rate mortgages right now uh, are making up the majority of these new loans. In fact, they're about 55% of all new mortgages. So we we'll expect to see some of those fixed rates coming down, but not right away here. It'll take some time before banks will adjust those fixed rates down, uh, which is why also we're seeing typically shorter than five-year terms. So it appears there is still relatively strong sentiment in the housing space, and that's increasing and people are taking action and getting mortgages. We're off a very low baseline here, like low, low. Things are slow, mm -hmm. and that's definitely emulated in our continuing sales data. So, hey, time for a quick mini market update because there's only three and a half days left of sales in this month. So we largely know where the month of July is going to wash out here. Quick note off the top, inventory-wise, I, I was wrong. I predicted something that we are going to see a 10-year high in active inventory this month just by crossing that 15,600 units. Now we didn't. It's kind of peaked at like 15,100, then it goes to 14,900. It's just kind of bouncing around the ceiling at, at 15,000 this whole month, up and down, up and down, up and down. So that's where we sit. We're going to wash out, I don't know, 14,000 or whatnot as, as people delist and expire at the end of the month. But we never hit that 10-year high this month. I, I fully thought we would. 
Sales on the month are about 2,000, almost on the nose as we record this. And they're going to come in around 100 less than last year. So sales volumes continues to drive down. It is slow, slow, slow out there for sales volumes. This based on where our inventory versus sales is, sales to active, um, sales to active ratio is going to end up around 15%. So that's trending downwards for the second straight month and is also in a balanced market for the second straight month. But let's talk prices because those are dropping pretty significantly right now. The median price of a home is down $15,000 so far this month, but the average price is down 78 grand in the month of July so far. This is, these are, these are bigger numbers. These are big numbers. This is a very notable shift in the marketplace. HPI understandably will get pulled down as well with these in the month of July, I could see upwards of like a 0.8 to 1% drop in a single month. It might take a bit for that to catch up. But anyway, that's about where it feels. And of course, that will dictate the second straight month of HPI declines in 2024 as well. And of course, next week, we'll update you on where the numbers actually uh, washed out and give you the hard data, but uh, expect downward trend in price through August as well. Ryan, any final words before we jump off? One of the big takeaways here, if you are a buyer, uh, certainly when you're in the market in today's market and a number of the deals we've put together over the last month, two months here, uh, almost every single one of them has been under the list price. Uh, we are getting deals done. Buyers are finding way, ways to get the property and get it for cheaper. Sellers, on the flip side, it, again, and we've, we've kind of echoed this before, if you are not priced to market, you are going to sit. And as you sit, and the longer you sit, and as these prices continue to soften, if you don't get in front of that, the chances of you selling get harder and harder and harder. Uh, though at some point here, we will see uh, some rate relief, which I think will chew more into inventory, but that I still think is months away. Perfect. And as always, if you're considering a move in real estate, please connect with us. Let's chat. We'd love to share our expertise and explore what you're looking to do in the marketplace and, and advise accordingly. You can just book a, a call with us below. There's a Calendly link. Reach out and uh, we'll explore what's happening and, and answer your questions about this ever dynamic real estate marketplace. Thanks as always and have a wonderful weekend.